In Acts chapter 7, we uh, read an account of the first Christian martyr, whose name is Stephen. Stephen was a Jewish convert to Christianity, and uh, he was accused by some Jews, by the Jewish authorities, of speaking, quote, blasphemous words against Moses and God. It's a pretty severe charge, right? The Jews accused him of speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. Now, of course, the real problem they had was that he was following Jesus, the Messiah, whom they did not acknowledge as the Messiah. But that was their accusation, uh, so that they would therefore have the right to stone him. When asked by the high priest if this was true, if he had in fact spoken blasphemous words against God and Moses, uh, Stephen proceeds to trace through the history of the Old Testament. He gives this great summary of the Old Testament. But as he does this, he points out uh, the Israelites' failure and in fact even their rejection of Moses. And so he turns the tables on them, right? He accuses, uh, he, he had been accused of speaking against Moses and now he um, accuses them. And then in verse 51 of Acts chapter 7, here's what Stephen says before he is stoned. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, that is Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. So not only did he turn the tables on them, but he spoke um, quite boldly, uh, testifying to Jesus as the righteous one, as this awaited Messiah. And so it was right after this that he was stoned, and, and uh, the text tells us that he looks up and he sees the heavens opened up, and he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, and, uh, and there is the end of Stephen's earthly life. Now this is not our text this morning. Uh, we're going to be in, in Matthew chapter 10. Um, but this illustrates what our text is about, and that is how we as God's people should fear only God and not man. Right? We should fear only God and not man. And so uh, the text is Matthew 10, beginning in verse 26. If you want to go ahead and turn there. It's a little bit of context. Uh, the uh, passages preceding this text um, Tell us about the, the disciples being sent out to do ministry. And, and Jesus warns them that they will face persecution. He tells them how to handle this persecution. Uh, but he makes it clear that they will, in fact, be persecuted. So it's in this context of, of facing persecution for the ministry of the gospel that uh, Jesus then says these words to them, beginning in verse 26. He says, So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Uh, let's pray as we uh, dive into this passage of Scripture. Dear God, we pray, Lord, that uh, we will heed these warnings, but that we'll also be comforted um, by these words of assurance that this gives us, about your loving care for us. Help us, Lord, to um, see how foolish it is for us to fear man, and for us to see, Lord, that uh, we should fear only God and not man. Help us to understand what that means, what that looks like. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So three reasons why we should fear only God and not man. And why we should fear God, but not man. And the first reason we see in this text is that the truth will prevail and we will be vindicated. Let me explain what I mean by that. Well, let's first, let's first read again these first two verses because 
I think we gather this from verses 26 and 27. So again, Jesus says, Have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. This is maybe a little bit confusing. Uh, what, what, is, what is Jesus getting at when he says this? Well, think about uh, Jesus and the way that he taught his disciples. Um, Jesus often, he spoke kind of in a hushed voice, didn't he? Um, not only to the disciples, but even to others. Like, for example, we see this in Mark especially. Uh, Mark, some, in, in Mark, sometimes whenever he heals someone or when someone um, begins to understand who he is, he, almost, he tells them, well, don't tell anybody who I am, right? And, and, and even in times when he's teaching the disciples, he kind of speaks in a hushed voice. As if he's he's kind of waiting for he's waiting for his time to come, right? There are times when he says, "My time has not yet come," and so so he kind of holds back a little bit, at least at the beginning of his ministry, um, because uh, he doesn't want to get himself in too hot of water uh, from the very beginning. So he'd speak in a hushed voice, and, and often, of course, he would speak in parables. And we're even told that uh, that Jesus spoke in parables so that some people would not understand. Right? So, so, of course, his parables, for those who were given ears to hear, his parables would actually illuminate the meaning of things. But then for others, it would actually keep them from understanding. All right? so, so, so I think this goes hand in hand with what Jesus is saying about you know, whispering things in the dark. Right? Uh, that's, that's how much of his teaching was, at least early on in his ministry. And then he became more and more bold. But Jesus says here to the disciples as he sends them out, he says, proclaim these things from the rooftops. And he tells them to do without fear. He says, do not fear, right? So he says, proclaim these things without fear, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Let me say one more thing about Jesus' teaching. Um, besides him speaking in a hushed voice and also speaking in parables, even, even his plain teaching, um, that he would speak out in the public, it, it wasn't always easy to understand, and it certainly wasn't always easy to accept. Okay? So, so, so I, I think there are a lot of layers to this. But what he's saying is, is that, okay, these, these things that may be covered now, um, I assure you, they will not remain covered. They will be revealed. And he tells them, he says, don't fear. He says, proclaim these things without fear, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. And so that's exactly what the disciples did, what the apostles did. Um, they went out and they proclaimed the teaching of Jesus, even in the face of persecution. And, and, and here, here's, here's how this connects with this first point. That is, the truth will prevail and we will be vindicated. Uh, the disciples understood that even though they were being persecuted, even though people didn't understand or believe all the things that they were saying, that they were speaking God's truth. And they, and they trusted Jesus when he said that, that nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Um, when Jesus told them to proclaim these things without fear, they did just that. Again, even in the face of persecution. Now, Jesus' death and his resurrection uh, later shed more light on the truth and meaning of his teaching. And it even vindicated the disciples uh, in some sense, right? I mean, uh, his resurrection in particular, that, that would vindicate uh, their commitment to Jesus and, and to Jesus' teaching. And, and again, it even sheds light on the meaning of Jesus' teaching. But understand that, that uh, even for them and even for us today, the fullness of this is not yet to come. So we can even bring this into our situation today. We recognize that um, people are going to reject some of the things that we say. Uh, people, are, people are going to maybe even ridicule us for believing in the gospel. Um, but, but we can have confidence that in the end, that ultimately in the end, that the truth will prevail and we will be vindicated. And uh, I want to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4-5 uh, just to illustrate that even though uh, they did have some uh, revelation and some vindication from Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, that, that for them and for us, there is more to come. Um, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 4, uses some of the same language that Jesus 
uh, used in that passage. And here Paul is he's defending the ministry of the uh, apostles. Here's what he says in verse 5. He says, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. And so here, Paul's talking more about the, the motives, right, the purposes of the heart, uh, that is, of, of the apostles, even himself. Um, he's, he's, saying, he's saying, don't pass a judgment, because when the Lord comes, he's going to bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. He's going to disclose the purposes of the heart. So basically, what, what Paul is saying here is, is similar to what Jesus is saying. It's, do not fear the injustices of man. Rather, leave it to God, who is not only just, but also the justifier of sinners like you and like me. So God is just, right? He, he, he's not going to um, bring about injustices upon us, like, for example, the persecution that the, that the apostles faced, even persecution that we might face. God is just. Um, and so, in one sense, that's good news, but if it were just that, it would actually ultimately be bad news for us. Because even though we might be falsely accused or, or in, 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 in one scenario um, or misunderstood in, in some situation, ultimately we are all guilty before God, aren't we? And ultimately, um, if it were just that God was just, uh, that, would mean, that would be bad news for us, right? We would receive our due punishment. But uh, isn't it wonderful, that Paul, as, as Paul says in Romans, that God is both just and the justifier. He is both the just and the justifier of those who believe. And so that gives us even um, greater confidence to, to just uh, leave it in the hands of God and to not fear, um, not fear man. When it comes to maybe being falsely accused, right? have, have people maybe inside or outside the church judged you wrongly? Um, that seems to be what's going on here in 1 Corinthians 4. Um, leave it to God. Do not fear the injustice of man, but rather leave it to God who is both just and justifier. But coming back now to Matthew chapter 10, um, perhaps some of us have even tasted a little bit of what Jesus described in Matthew 10. Now, I'll, I'll touch on this more later, but you know the reality is that most of us, I mean, we, we've suffered nothing compared to what the disciples faced, to what the, those in the early church faced. Uh, what, we call, what we might call persecution, nothing compared to them. And yet still, um, it's, uh, it is something uh, in, in the, in the uh, grand scheme of things. And uh, whether it's being ridiculed or, or just thought of a fool to, to believe this or that, we can have confidence that the truth will prevail and that we will be vindicated, that God will uncover all things, and that, um, and that uh, our commitment to the gospel, our proclamation of the gospel, uh, will not uh, be revealed as foolish, but it will, will be uh, revealed as the truth. And so, and so we, don't, we don't need to fear what others might think, what others might say. Um, we don't fear man, we fear God. And yet, even, even our fear of God is, is, is different than how one might fear man, right? Um, we, we fear God with, with a reverence and awe, and, and uh, we'll touch on this more as we go as well. But, uh, but this is the first reason we see why we should fear only God and not man, and that is that the truth will prevail and we will be vindicated. The second reason why we should fear only God and not man is that man has only finite power over us, while God has infinite power over us. So back here in our text, in Matthew 10. Verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell kind of puts things in perspective, doesn't it? We need to consider this closely, though, and think about this, that if this life 
were all that there is, then we actually would have good reason to fear man, right? Um, you know, this, this text makes a comparison. It says, do not fear man who can kill the body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. All right, so when you, when, you, when you compare destroying both body and soul in hell to killing man, well, killing man doesn't sound all that bad. Um, but uh, if this life were all there, there was, that'd be something to be pre pretty afraid of, right? And perhaps that is why many believers are afraid of man, because we live life as if this is all there is. Right? Now we know, we know, we believe that, that there is a life to come, but, but sometimes it is easy for us to, to slip into this mentality uh, to, to, to live our lives in such a way that this life is all that there is. And one sign that you might be doing that is a fear of man. A fear of man makes perfect sense if this life is all that there is. But if this life is not all that there is, then, uh, then a fear of man does not make so much sense. And also, um, I find it interesting, coming back to what we might face as persecution versus what they face as persecution. Isn't it interesting that the uh, thing that, that we seem to fear the most is what people think, right? Um, we're not really in, in great danger of losing our lives, right? We, we, just, we just might be afraid of what people think of us. And yet, while we make a big deal of what other people think, this text makes a very small deal about the fact that others might kill us, or at least the, the disciples uh, at this time. Isn't that interesting? We make a big deal about what others think of us, and yet this verse makes a very small deal about the fact that others might kill us. Um, again, that puts things into perspective. We, uh, we need not fear man, but we should fear God and fear God only. And again, this, uh, this fear is, is a, a, a reverence, a reverent awe. It's a recognition that God has the power to do with us whatever he will. Not only the power, but the right. I praise God for the gospel and that, uh, that he chose to send his son to die for our sins so that we might be forgiven, so, so that we might be um, reconciled to God. God didn't have to do that. And, uh, and, and, and even now, even as believers, God has every right to snuff us out at any moment that he wants, right? Um, our, our life is in his hands. And, uh, and if, it, if it weren't for his grace in Jesus Christ, um, our eternal life would, uh, would be destined to, uh, to punishment uh, in hell. Uh, and that would be completely just for God to do so. And so, and so we fear him recognizing that he has the power, that he has the right to do whatever he will. Um, and yet we, uh, we also um, appreciate the, the grace that he has given us and not um, giving us what we deserve, but instead granting forgiveness to Jesus Christ. And so um, we fear God with this kind of reverent awe, and we do not fear man. As a side note, um, this passage, verse, verse, verse 28, 28 in particular, it's a reminder to us that uh, whether experienced in heaven or hell, that uh, we will be in bodies. Right? So, so I've just spent uh, a good six weeks preaching on 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of the dead. And of course, that focuses in on the resurrection of believers. But we did note, like in John chapter 5, for example, other places in Scripture make it clear that both the, the wicked and the righteous will be raised in the last day. And so, um, whether you're in heaven or in hell, it will be experienced not only in soul, but in body, right? He says, fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Both body and soul. And, and the word destroyed here, um, this is just a little freebie. The, the, the word destroyed here, it does not mean annihilated, okay? And um, I think you probably recognize that, but there, there's actually a, uh, there's a theology that's becoming more and more prevalent in the church 
It's, it's a theology called annihilationism, which is the idea that, that hell is, is, is not eternal, but that a person is annihilated. Um, maybe after you know, suffering for a certain amount of time, then they're just no more. And, and, and actually, uh, this, is, this is a verse that the one might point to, say that, uh, we're, that body and soul is destroyed in hell. We have to understand the meaning of destroyed. So um, the, a really good way to understand the meaning of a word is to see how it's used elsewhere. And so we see in Scripture, Jesus, for example, remember when he gives this, uh, this analogy of, of the wineskin, of putting um, old or new wine into old wineskins? He says the, the wineskin will burst and be destroyed. Now you tell me, whenever a wineskin is destroyed, does it cease to exist? Is it annihilated? No, no, that, that, that's not the meaning of destroyed. And so that's not the meaning of destroyed here either when it's talking about um, someone uh, suffering in hell. The, uh, the meaning of destroyed is, is, is to be undone, to no longer serve the purpose for which you were intended, right? So if a wine skin burst, well, it's destroyed. You can't, you can't use it to hold wine anymore, right? It's broken. It's destroyed. And, and, and that's, that's the kind of destruction one faces uh, with the prospect of hell. That is, that is a, no longer serving the purpose for which you were designed. And, and there are all kinds of implications, and we could spend a long time talking about it, um, some have suggested perhaps you lose the image of God um, if, uh, if you are to go to hell. Um, right? We were created in the image of God to, to reflect God, to be his image bearers, and, um, and, and uh, perhaps in hell that uh, is taken away. Um, but the point is that, that destroyed here, it means to be undone. It means to no longer serve the function for which you were created. And, and that's, that is a... Uh, um, that's a much more frightening prospect than just being completely annihilated, isn't it? Uh, this kind of eternal destruction, which is an, a, a phrase that another passage in Scripture uses. And so, uh, so don't fear man who can just kill the body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And that kind of sounds like some fire and brimstone preaching, right? And it kind of is. Um, we, we, we need to recognize the... the uh, the severity of this, but uh, but look look to see where he turns immediately on the heels of that. That brings us to the third point: God providentially cares for those who fear Him. So this is the third reason we should fear only God and not man, because God providentially cares for those who fear Him. And so immediately after giving this this warning of God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. He says this, um, and uh, we'll focus first on verses 29 through 31, and then we'll look at uh, 32 and 33. Verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. That's quite the turn, isn't it? Right? We have we have this this wrath, this um, fear God who can destroy both body and soul in, in hell, and then this this wonderful um, image of, of God caring for us so much that He knows the the number of hairs on our head, that uh, um, that He ca He even cares for the sparrows. How much more, therefore, does He care for us? God providentially cares, providentially cares for those who fear him. He cares for you, and, 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 and nothing happens to you apart from his sovereign will. There in uh, verse 29, it says that uh, not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father. Uh, Holman Christian Standard uh, says, without your father's consent. Now, um, so first of all, this tells us that God is sovereign, that he cares for us, he providentially cares for us, nothing happens to us apart from his say-so, um, and, uh, and that's good because he cares for us, so we can trust him. Um, and also, also, the key word here is, is the word father, right? Um, we, uh, we, I, I think sometimes we might just skim over this, the use of the word father in Scripture because 
you know, it's commonly used to refer to God. But, uh, but what, what an incredible thought that the God of the universe is our Father. That is, those who belong to him through Jesus. He is our Father. And he's a good Father. He's a loving Father. He cares for us. And so um, I, I've hit a little bit on how we are to fear God, right? Um, while we don't fear man, we do fear God, but we, we don't fear God in the same way that we might fear man, right? We fear him, as I've said, with, with a reverent awe. Another way to think of it is we fear him, I think, in a much more magnified way, but similar to how one might fear a good father. So let me explain. I think sometimes when, um, especially in, in our day and time, I think sometimes the, the whole idea of fear of God just gets lost in translation. And people think, oh, well, that means that, that I'm supposed to be afraid of God, like I'm going to run and hide from him. Well, that's, that's how you fear a bad father, right? Like if you, got, if you have a father who's got a temper, a father who's, who's abusive, yeah, you know, when, when dad comes home and, and, and you're in trouble, you might, you might run away and, 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 and hide. But uh, what about a good father? A father who, who, who disciplines but does so lovingly um, better than any of us. I mean, God, God, of course, does this better than any earthly father can. But, uh, but there's an analogy here. Um, there is a difference in a way a child might fear a good father who, who, who disciplines but, but does it in love? That's a different kind of fear than, than a child who's afraid he's going to get smacked across the face and, and get cussed at, right? There's, there's, there's a difference there. And so when we think about fearing God, um, we recognize God is, is not this short-tempered, angry father, but he's a loving father who cares for us. And yes, he disciplines us. Um, and yes, uh, he, he has much more power and authority over us than any earthly father, and so therefore it's magnified. Our fear of him is even magnified, but, uh, but we see this, this, maybe this similarity to how one might fear a good and loving earthly father. And, and the scriptures make that parallel, don't they? Like um, when it says that you know, even, even a good father, or even, even a, 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 an imperfect father on earth, when you ask him for... Bread is not going to give you a stone. When you ask him for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. How much more will your heavenly Father care for you? Right? So, so he cares for us, he loves us, and yet he's to be feared as, as, as our authority, as, as, as one who can discipline us, as the creator. Right? He's the a, he's a creator, we are the created, and, uh, and we, we recognize that with awe and with reverence. And I think, I think uh, a truth we can glean from this is that the more that we fear God, the less we're going to fear man. And yet the more we fear man, the less we're going to fear God. Um, let's continue on to verse 32 and 33. Now one more thing before we do. I wanted to point out this verse to you, Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Isn't that a wonderful verse? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now let's look on to verses 32 and 33. Um, you know, some, some Bibles... Uh, divide this text differently. Of course, you probably know in, in your Bibles that the headings there are not part of the original text. The headings there are added just to um, kind of give us what the topic is, to, to help divide it up for us. And so it's not always done the same way. And so some Bibles will um, stop there at the end of verse 31 and, and, and have a new heading before verse 32. And then others do not. Uh, I think that verses 32 and 33 do go well with this, with this passage. Um, because they, they give us further understanding on how we are to fear only God and not man. And so, um, once again, we, we come to a warning. And so we kind of have uh, these words of assurance sandwiched between some warnings, right? So the first warning is, you know, uh, do not fear man who can 
kill only the body, but fear him who could destroy both body and soul in hell. Then we have these words of assurance of God's loving care for us. And then we come back to, in verse 32, a warning. He says, So whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So really the latter part is a warning, but, but in fact the, the first part of this is, is an assurance um, that if we acknowledge God before men, then uh, God will acknowledge us. But the warning is that if we deny God before men, that he will deny us before, that is Jesus will deny us before his Father in heaven. And so again, uh, I'll repeat uh, what I said a moment ago, the more you fear God, the less you will fear man. And you'll boldly acknowledge God before man, right? So um, you'll find yourself in the first half of this verse. That is, if you fear God, um, you're going to not fear man. You're going to boldly acknowledge God before man, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of ridicule, even when it costs you. Yet if you fear man, um, you will not fear God as you should. And you might find yourself at the end of this uh, passage in verse 33, denying the Father before men. Right? That would be a sign of fearing man and not God, right? And so we, we see that, uh, that um, these two go hand in hand. If we fear God, we will not fear man, but if we fear man, we're not fearing God as we should. And so, so we, have, we have this warning. Um, but I, I want to close with, uh, with one more assurance. Um, with a cel celebration of, of what God has done for us through the cross. Because when I, when I read a passage like this, that, that has its fair share of warnings, although it does have um, this, uh, this wonderful assurance of God as our loving Father, when I read passages like this, I become exceedingly grateful for the cross. Because I know that uh, while I am to fear God greatly, as, we, as we've established, this fear is, is a completely different kind of fear than, well certainly than one might have towards man, but it's even a different kind of fear than we might have, than we would have if it weren't for the cross, right? If, if, it, if it weren't for the cross, if it weren't for Jesus, then um, we would, we would uh, have good reason to run and hide from God. Um, but, uh, but because of Christ, because of the forgiveness we can have through him, um, we find refuge in Christ. And, uh, and we don't have to run from God. That's not the kind of fear that we have, right? We don't have the kind of fear where we're running and hiding, but we have a fear in which we take refuge in, in the very one whom we are fearing. Right? And we even, we even see that in the Old Testament before the cross, but, but that's only possible because of Jesus, right? Even, even the grace of God that we see in the Old Testament is because of Christ. Do you realize that? And so, so even in the Old Testament, we have, we have this, um, this concept of taking refuge in God from God, right? Uh, it's... it's, it's, it's uh, it's kind of paradoxical. We, uh, we find our refuge in the one from whom we're seeking refuge. Right? We don't have to run and hide, but we can find forgiveness through Jesus. We can find forgiveness at the cross. And so, so the kind of fear that we have when we fear God because of the cross, because of Jesus, it's not a hopeless, defeating kind of fear, but rather it's a humbling, awe-inspiring, gratitude-inducing fear. And so, in the midst of these warnings uh, this morning, I want to be sure that we celebrate that because of the cross, Christ will accomplish before his Father those things, that he will acknowledge before the Father those who acknowledge him before men, uh, which is another wonderful assurance that we have. Right? Um, God will, Jesus will acknowledge before the Father those who acknowledge him before men. So what a wonderful truth. And so, so uh, um, my prayer for for you all, for myself, is that um, we will continually grow in the fear of the Lord um, and, and the right kind of fear and a reverent awe and wonder of who he is 
And that uh, as we do that, that our fear of man will decrease. And that we will be bold in, in, in our commitment to the gospel and our proclamation of the gospel. And that, uh, and that we can um, rest in, in Christ. What a wonderful truth. Let us, uh, let us pray and then uh, we will be done. Dear God, we, uh, we thank you that we don't have to run and hide from you. That that's not uh, the kind of fear that we are to have, but that, uh, that you are a loving Father who has brought salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we, uh, we fear you, and yet we also take refuge in you. And, uh, and we pray that as we do that, Lord, that we will not fear man, for the Lord is on our side. What can man do to me? Do not let us be manipulated by this world, beholden to this world, uh, but let us, let us serve you and the gospel for your kingdom's sake. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we have our time of invitation now, so uh, would you stand with me?